Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on Disaster Preparedness Policies and Drills, presented by our sponsor, Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Deb Beto, and I will be your moderator today and be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discussed can be found at the URL that's currently showing on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. If you have audio difficulties or a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Please feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you are using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, and then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will try to work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we, we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one-hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout, and the presenters will be answering questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number of webinars upcoming covering a variety, variety of topics, including those listed at the Heffernan webinar website. In addition, we offer the mandatory preventing harassment training in English three times a year. With that, let's begin today's presentation. Disaster Pre Preparedness Policies and Drills. Today's interactive session will be facilitated by Ed Langmaid. Ed Langmaid is a managing consultant with Aspen Risk Management Group. His principal responsibilities are to align business continuity activities, including emergency response, crisis management, and business recovery. Ed is a former director of business continuity planning at BAE Systems. Ed joined BAE Systems in March of 1978. In 2007, he assumed the position of Director of Business Continuity Planning and Occupational Safety and Health. At BAE Systems, Ed was responsible for all business continuity activities, including emergency response, crisis management, and business recovery, as well as developing communication plans for disaster preparedness and response. Ed is a graduate of National University with a bachelor's and master's degrees in occupational safety and health management and master's, de master's degrees in business management and advanced business management. Ed served 20 years in the United States Navy, four years active duty and 16 years in the U.S. Navy Reserves, retiring as a Naval Intelligence Officer in 1994. Ed is an Emergency Services Sector Co-Chief at InfraGuard, a nonprofit organization sponsored by the FBI to fight terrorism in the private sector, and he is an active member of San Diego CERT, the Community Emergency Response Team, and their Amateur Radio Communications Team. In 1994, Ed received the Safety Professional of the Year Award from the American Society of Safety Professionals. Today's webinar is just one of many community presentations on disaster preparedness and response that Ed is conducting this year. Ed, it's all yours. Why, thank you very much, Deb. Uh, before we get started, one last item is the disclaimer that you can read now or when you get the soft copy after the webinar. It will be useful to have an idea of what type of company you represent today, and I, I will try to use examples that are relevant to your business. All right, so then let's launch the first polling question. Which type of company do you represent? Are you in manufacturing, office personnel, primarily office personnel, construction, or other? And I'd like to encourage everyone to participate in the voting if you can. We're going to wait until we've got 70 to 80% voting so that 
everybody gets used to how to use the voting buttons. All right, Ed, so it looks like we have 14% in manufacturing, 36% that are office personnel, 4% construction, and a whopping 47% other. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for voting. Hey, here we go. There's always a risk of a disaster. There are very few parts of the country where there are, there's no threat of a natural disaster. And a man-made disaster can occur anywhere. Today's webinar will cover disaster preparedness, policies, and drills. We will discuss how you and your company will recover from a disaster it had yesterday. Yes, yesterday. Our mock disaster occurred yesterday right after normal working hours. It doesn't matter what type of disaster. All disasters will result in an impact to you, your family, other employees, and the company. Even if you're not on the leadership team of the company, you will play a significant role in the days and weeks following a disaster. And especially if you have a family or people you are taking care of, your time, energy, and thoughts will conflict between work and home responsibilities. Let me repeat this for emphasis. Your time, energy, and thoughts will conflict between work and home responsibilities, and you will not be very effective when you're torn between work and home. You and everyone else did what they could after the mock disaster occurred last night. You decided on immediate actions to take, and we will discuss details of those actions towards the end of this webinar. All right, so we have our next polling question. Which of these disasters will cause the most harm to your company? Would it be flood or fire in the building, which is commonly a local disaster, a flu pandemic, which is a national disaster, workplace violence incident, another local disaster, or a regional disaster such as earthquake, hurricane, or tornado? So we've got about 30% oh, of the people that have voted. Again, we're going to wait until a uh, a good number of you have voted so that we make sure that we've got some good participation happening here. And Ed, we've got 33% say uh, flood or fire in the building, 4% say flu pandemic, 18% say workplace violence, and the majority of the people are saying the regional disaster like earthquake, hurricane, or tornado. Thanks so much, Deb, and thank you again for voting. Uh, and Sorry for the trick question, but there's really no right or wrong answers to this poll. The idea is to get you thinking about disasters. They can come in many shapes and sizes. Business survival could depend on many things, including the recovery of important computer files or quick resumption of business so competition doesn't take away all of your customers. Obviously, there are a lot of factors that play a part in the ability of a company to recover from a disaster. And I hope that you will see that it's important to plan for disaster. So what happened in our hypothetical disaster? Well, if the incident were an earthquake, this could be the situation. If it were a tornado or hurricane, it could be equally devastating. It is now 10 a.m. on August 27, 2019 today. You are responding to the consequences of the disaster. One problem is that many of the employees did not come to work today. Many disaster plans list all of the things you need to do, but rarely do they take into consideration the impact of significant absenteeism and reduced work performance after a disaster. Consider the first four bullets here. Your employees are injured. Some of them are seriously injured. Half of the employees won't come to work for a week. Some had family issues. Some were so affected by the disaster, they just couldn't leave home. Most of those employees who show up, including you, are distracted and non-productive. They want to work, but they just keep thinking about and worrying about the disaster. And to make matters worse, you're not in contact with your leaders. You'll note that, shoot, even suppliers were impacted and your customers need your products or services right away. 
you can see that a disaster can really impact your company's ability to do business. Even if your business itself is not severely damaged, without employees, your company will not be able to meet the needs of your customers. Do you think that your company could do a better job if, of business recovery if more employees were able to get back to real work? I hope you'll say yes. Once your employees return to work with clear heads, they will really help your business recover and move on. A moment without me. Please read this. Point number one, the more calm the employees are after disaster, the faster they, their families, and business will return to normal. But you can't force them to be calm after a disaster. They are stressed out, confused, and conflicted. It is human nature. Maybe when robots take over, it'll be different. But for now, businesses will be impacted by humans responding to the disaster. How can we help this poor person? Well, maybe you can't. At this point, the confusion, confliction, and stress will have to run its course. But if, what if you could back up before the disaster and help her prepare for the disaster? Would that help? Sure. The best solution for being able to respond to a disaster is to be prepared for a disaster. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? We said that you might have half the employees not returning to work. Just think if you could change that and have an absentee rate of only 10% after the disaster. How much better would it be to have only 40% of those who show up being non-productive instead of 90%? I think you would agree that would help tremendously for the recovery of business and to get some normal activities back to the people. Is such a dream really possible after disaster? Yes, people who are prepared for a disaster, now that's being really prepared, not just pretending to be prepared. They recover quicker after a disaster. They know the disaster could occur, the family is prepared, and it's easier to see beyond the disaster situation. Disaster planning is important for individuals and companies. Simply stated, Disaster planning includes three pieces, pre-disaster actions, disaster response, and then disaster recovery. The combination of those three activities is oftentimes called business continuity planning, and the document is a business continuity plan. All right, so let's find out who has a business continuity plan. Do you know if your company has a business continuity plan? If you can give us some voting here, we'll get an indication of uh, how prepared our audience is and how much detail we need to go into here. So we've got about 60% of the people voting. Thank you very much. I'm gonna wait for just a few more people. And it looks like, Ed, we have 37% uh, say yes, 14% say I don't know, and the rest say I don't think so. Okay, thank you very much for voting and thanks Deb. Let's talk about disaster planning. You might have better success in keeping your business in business after a disaster if you've taken these steps, starting at the top going clockwise, prevention, and we'll talk about each of these individually, then preparedness, and then testing before a disaster. Then the response planning, which is planning how to respond during and immediately following a disaster. And then recovery planning, planning how you're actually gonna recover from the disaster. Now we realize that your business cannot devote a team of dozens of people to work full-time on disaster planning. However, there are things that we can do that are logical and simple that will help employees and the business. Let's briefly discuss the basics of each of these disaster planning steps. In this use of the word prevention, we are discussing the reduction of risk to the business and employees before a disaster. 
So we're not going to be preventing a disaster, at least like a natural disaster. What we're going to be doing is preventing uh, injury and harm because of the disaster. Hazard identification and mitigation is a standard business practice at any company. Safety inspections or audits identify hazards such as OSHA regulation and fire code violations. Prevention is just one more step to identify hazards associated with potential disasters and address them as well. For example, if you are, if you are in earthquake country, you would want to remove heavy objects like trophies from tall bookcases unless they and the bookcase are properly secured to the wall. In tornado country, you would want to have a safe place for people to go if the tornado is approaching. These actions fall into risk management. Each risk that you identify is managed with four options. You can avoid the risk, that's the best option, but it's not always the logical option. The tornado risk can be avoided by just moving the business to another part of the country. But you can mitigate or reduce the risk of the tornado by providing for warning systems and a secure place to protect people if a tornado strikes your area. One of the risks is your computer system and the important data that it contains. You may not be able to avoid the risk of a computer loss, but you can mitigate the risk or reduce the risk by relocating the computer to a safer spot at the site or transferring the risk by arranging for a hot site for a backup computer system or having a contractor house your computer at a more protected location. The fourth, but not necessarily the last option, sometimes you accept the risk because the risk probability is low or the business impact is low. You cannot prevent a natural disaster, obviously, but you can take measures to reduce the risks when that disaster occurs. In the last slide, prevention, we identified the hazards and took actions on them where we could. With preparedness, we prepare for the disaster with additional actions. Your business should have a simple but complete disaster response plan. I say simple because there are too many complicated disaster response plans in thick binders collecting dust and being forgotten. Complete means you included the primary issues you need to deal with before and after a disaster. I recommend the Business Continuity Planning Suite developed by the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA. It's a free document. It's actually a software suite. It was created to help any business create, improve, or update its business continuity plan. The suite is scalable for optimal use by organizations of any size and includes business continuity plan, training, and an exercise for testing your business continuity plan. There are two other links on this slide that might help, help you, and they are from the Small Business Administration. Your business will need to have a grasp on what business processes are critical to recover first after a disaster. That takes you to the business analysis process, a part of our preparedness plan. A business impact analysis is an evaluation of business functions and processes. It gathers information so you can set strategies to reduce the consequences of a disaster. Sometimes the business impact analysis is done with a team approach so that all aspects of the function can be analyzed from all businesses areas point of view. You would normally see the representative from departments such as operations, HR, security and procurement, but it depends on the business, whether it's an office environment or manufacturing environment, etc. In an office environment, you might have a team consisting of uh, customer service, facilities, HR, and finance. If the business has critical functions that cannot easily be replicated or replaced, 
then you need to plan for how you will recover those operations and how fast you can do so because they are critical. The end result of a business impact analysis is a process to recover the critical functions as quickly and safely as possible. Here's a story. Let's call it a made up story. A 40 per employee business called Liquid Grapes Unlimited has a small machine shop and offers a complete solution for helping drain wine from wine barrels that are just the right velocity. The solution is automatic and uses special software invented by the CEO to operate the product. Question is, what might Liquid Grapes' critical functions be? Well, they required me to black out the equipment because of the sensitive nature of the product. But what is, the, what is critical to the company's operations? Payroll. You have to pay your employees. So you need to have a backup plan for issuing pay if there's a disaster. Manufacturing, they use one of a kind special tools in this process. They have specialized software to run the business and specialized software to support the product. They have one expert who knows the complete product and how it's made. The business impact analysis will identify and track solutions for the critical functions. Every business is different, but they all have critical functions. In this case, wine tasting is not as critical as the other functions listed. Your operation may have critical functions in software or in supplying uh, human resources. There are a lot of different options here. Moving on to critical suppliers, if your business has critical suppliers, then that risk needs attention. If you can't find and arrange for a secondary supplier, then you need to determine what can be done to reduce that risk. Liquid Grapes Company critical suppliers might be the tools and software they use to run the business, as well as the payroll process they contract out for. Do the critical suppliers themselves have their own business continuity plans in place and tested. If they fail, they won't be able to provide you the right resources. And do they have critical suppliers? And do those critical suppliers have processes in place to protect against disasters? Critical customers. If you have multiple customers and it is appropriate to prioritize which is more critical, after a disaster, your output could be temporarily cut in half. Knowing which customers to focus on will help critical customers get what they need. Yes, all customers think they're most important. Company leadership will know who gets their attention first. It could be because of a contract wording or the needs of a government or other commitments to the customer. And finally, critical jobs. Whether it is the company president or an IT or a laser machine expert, others need to be knowledgeable so they can step in after disaster. Known as succession planning, critical jobs will still need to be done after disaster, so they need to be planned for. Sometimes the human aspect of a disaster event is left out of disaster planning. But as mentioned before, employees are gonna help the business recover. We will cover each of these bullets separately. If policies and checklists can be developed before a disaster, implementing those policies and using those checklists will be a lot easier after a disaster. Yes, it could be a lot of policies, such as these, this list and the next page, but it's much easier to grab an approved policy than to try to fabricate one and get it approved on the spot after a disaster. Let's use the last bullet on this slide as an example. It is so easy to rely on HR to make quick decisions after a disaster, but since we are all distracted from a disaster, it's best to include legal counsel in unplanned decisions, and that could be a policy from your HR organization. Here are more policy examples. 
Please note that some of these policies will be just a paragraph long, but they will be difficult to design during a disaster. For some companies, some of these issues will be minor. With other companies, they could be major. Besides policies, great tools to have at the ready are disaster checklists. Checklists are an extremely important tool for those in business recovery. The first bullet links to one comprehensive checklist that is appropriate and thorough. It queries the business, in this case after a disaster, about insurance, cleaning, reestablishing the business, managing and paying staff, and planning for the future. Based on your online answers, it provides lists of actions to help you. A great tool, especially if you have access to the internet after a disaster. It is from Australia, but is a good approach. You can take the information from that checklist and make your own based on your business in advance of the disaster, not right after disaster. Each support organization will benefit with a disaster checklist for their organization. A simple disaster checklist can be tailored from your disaster policy, allowing for priority actions so that key activities are not forgotten. We are still in the preparedness section. Disaster supplies at a business is a delicate matter. You can't maintain a huge warehouse of food, water, cots, etc., unless you are a place like Walmart or Costco or maybe a faith-based organization. But you can develop a preparedness culture in your business, and that will help a great deal. Employees will have, a, have supplies in their cars so that no matter where they are, when a disaster strikes, they are prepared. A business can have some supplies available. Many already do so in the form of bottled water, vending machines, and first aid kits. If you have a floor warden for fire drills, those individuals might be the right candidates for a disaster kit that includes first aid, water, walkie-talkies, etc. Of course, regular training sessions will help so people respond properly with their kits. Employees are the key to helping the business recover. In the last slide, I mentioned an individual preparedness culture. Most people won't prepare for disaster without a combination of education, peer support, and role models doing it first. It's human nature to think that a disaster won't happen to us. We can all recall the people sitting on the on houses in hurricanes or after hurricanes waiting to be helped. A business can help employees prepare with the disaster preparedness campaign that could include a preparedness fair, lunchtime activities, and involvement with community preparedness events. Local vendors and organizations like preparedness suppliers and the American Red Cross will normally be happy to support your event. If leadership actually shows how they are becoming more prepared, your prepared culture will ramp up quickly. It doesn't have to cost much to run the campaign. What is important is a sincere commitment by the business about preparedness. The best solution for being able to respond to a disaster is to be prepared for the disaster. The disaster supply kit will be discussed in depth shortly, but I want to discuss what I feel is the most important piece of preparation. My goal for you today is to take at least one thing from this presentation and act on it this week. Doing just one thing will help develop your internal preparedness culture. This week, not next week got plenty of time left in this week. Today would be even better, as a matter of fact. Obviously, if the leadership team is vis visibly supportive of preparedness activities, it will make it easier to implement disaster policies, influence a preparedness culture, and to acquire preparedness supplies. All right, so let's find out what our audience thinks. In a disaster, what is the most important thing to have available? Is it contact information for all family members? 
water, a first aid kit, toolkit and cash, or internet access. So I'm going to wait until we've got a good number of the people that are voting so that we can make sure everybody's still um, paying attention and remaining interactive and um, and not sleeping. And, and not sleeping, right. All right, so Ed, 22% say contact information for all family members, 50% say water, 19% say a first aid kit, 4% say first or, or a toolkit and cash, and the major, minority say internet access. All right, well, I'm glad for the people who figured out the internet access was not the most important thing. Very good on that. All right, so Google, no. Text messaging, no. Whiskey, no. Clothes, maybe. YouTube, no. Family disaster plan, not yet. The number one thing to have for disaster is water. Yes, water. You would make my day if all of you would take steps to have water ready for a disaster. And I say that because no matter where your family is, if they have water and you have water, if you're separated, you will at least be comfortable knowing that they can survive for a day or two, wherever they are. In a disaster, water helps you survive. We can't depend on normal public water systems in a disaster. And you probably can't depend on your neighbors. They may not be so giving after the disaster. I'm gonna stop for a drink of water right now. How much water do you think you need for a disaster for a family of three with a large dog? All right, we'll launch that polling question. So is it 10 gallons, 15 gallons, 20 gallons, or 50 gallons? Remember, this is a family of three with a large dog. And wait just another moment or two for some more people to chime in here. All right, Ed, you'll be happy to know that only 3% say 10 gallons. 18% say 15 gallons, 36% say 20 gallons, and 44% say 50 gallons. Wow, that's quite a range. Thank you very much. Well, taking into consideration that we don't know what the disaster is going to be, and we don't know how many people will actually be in our house when the disaster strikes, we recommend something a little bit different than what's been been discussed in the past. It used to be that they said, oh, a gallon a day for three days would be good. So in that case, 15 gallons would be, be all right. What, what experts are now saying, because the, the severity of disasters are increasing and the number of people is increasing, uh, we, uh, we need to have about 50 gallons of water in this particular case because that dog may be thirsty. We recommend you have a gallon per day per person for two weeks. That seems like an awful lot of water if you consider how many little bottles, little plastic bottles of water that would be. But there are some, some alternatives to that. And we will get to that in a minute. You need to have water everywhere that you are. Experts now say that it's safe to drink the water that has been stored in cars before. That was, there was some controversy about that. All you do is check the expiration date on the plastic bottles and replace them when it's appropriate. This, shows, this slide shows that you can protect your car from water leaking in your car by merely storing the water in a secondary tub. I'll let you read the first part of the slide on your own. Well, 
Most people have a 50 gallon reservoir at their home in the form of a water heater tank. Those that do not have access to a water heater tank or have a tankless water heater, you have a bit more preparedness actions to do. If you have a water heater tank, you can use that tank for drinking water unless the water source becomes contaminated before it gets to the tank. So after disaster, you can turn off the supply side so you have a good quantity of drinkable water. Should still have other options though. Plan B is just having some bottles of water and plan C is using a water reservoir that you can fill in your bathtub. Plan D, use the water filter for rainwater and other sources of water is a good idea. And please note, you shouldn't drink swimming pool water. Even if filtered with a particle filter, swimming pool water will contain dissolved salts and that can cause injuries, kidney injury if consumed over a few days time. If you distill swimming pool water, that is okay. But just uh, use uh, swimming pool water for cleaning, uh, flushing toilets, and bathing. And you can set reminders on your computer calendar to replace water bottles. And please note where the water's shutoff valve is on your home disaster checklist. After you have water in all the right places, you can take additional steps to increase the preparedness culture of you and your family. You can make a family preparedness plan with the family and practice it every six months. You can get the family involved so you can be confident they can take appropriate actions, even if you are not there when a disaster occurs. What should you have in your disaster kit? You can use the preparedness supply list from ready.gov. Has preparing for disaster cost much? For less than $100, you can have supplies that will help you survive a disaster and you will not be a burden to emergency services or neighbors. Remember, because the severity of disasters are increasing, you should have enough food and water for two weeks. I mentioned a preparedness culture. The more a company promotes a preparedness culture with the employees, the greater chances it will survive a disaster. And if the most respected people are leading the bandwagon of preparedness, the culture will grow. If only one person in the company is preparing, it won't help with business and employee recovery. But if the company culture is to promote preparedness and recognize the importance of preparing, that preparedness culture will become commonplace and very natural. One great source of preparedness information is from ready.gov. They have sections that address business preparedness as well as individual and family preparedness. And it's free, it just takes a little bit of your time. What we have discussed so far, the more calm, cool, and collected the employees are after the disaster, the faster they, their families, and their business will return to normal but you can't force employees to be more calm after disaster. The solution, the more people are prepared and the families are prepared, the easier it'll be to get back to normal. Point to remember number two. One person being prepared is good for that person. And if everyone is prepared, the synergy is quite beneficial for the community and the business. Earlier, we discussed our mock disaster that occurred yesterday. Besides people not being prepared and therefore distracted, confused, and conflicted, there were other issues, you might recall. Several key members of your leadership team are out of contact. Your suppliers are also impacted by the disaster. Your customers need your products or services right away. Your business continuity plan should enable your team to take actions in response to the disaster. But you need to see if the plan will work. You'd better test the plan. You need to know that your business can properly support your customers 
after disaster. Testing the plan helps to fix gaps and to train your team members to perform the roles. There are several different types of exercises, as you can see on this slide. Some of the tests are simple and involve a lot of people, like a fire drill. And some involve just a few people, like a tabletop exercise. They have different purposes. Once you have a business impact analysis, as we discussed earlier, you know what critical things need to be done first, and the testing can be customized to focus on those critical processes. For more information, you can go to ready.gov. Every disaster is different, but responding in a disaster uses the same initial actions. You engage your brain, you take a breath or two or three, and then use your brain. The actions taken in the initial minutes of a disaster are critical. A prompt warning to employees to evacuate, shelter, or lock down can save lives but the wrong move can lose lives. So there are right things to do in a disaster, and then there are the other things. For example, in an earthquake country, we know to get under something sturdy and hold on. It's still a natural response to run outside the building, but there's a higher risk of injury. Drop, cover, and hold on. The, California, the information employees receive from your business will help them know what to do when a disaster occurs. Go to ready.gov for more information. So what does that look like? Well, easy to use information is available right here at ready.gov. As mentioned before, we are firm the importance of being ready. A disaster can happen at any time to anybody from workplace violence active shooter, to illnesses, to earthquakes, tornadoes, natural disasters. If you and your family have taken a few easy steps, there's a greater chance you will survive without injury. On the top right-hand corner of ready.gov are three dots. There's a pull-down menu. Here are all the things you really need to do or be aware of starting with building a kit once you have your water ready in all locations. After a disaster, the business needs to recover. Here's where you recover your normal operations, including computer systems, and recover customer confidence. Recovery might include relocating the business, expensive repair to the building or equipment, using mutual aid agreements to get other, other organizations to help you, getting new suppliers, the list goes on and on. Your business continuity plan, based on your impact analysis, will guide you. And recover, after recovery, it is time to use the experience to improve the plan for the next time. In our mock disaster, you and everyone else did what they could after the mock disaster occurred last night. You decided on the immediate actions to take. Well, we said we would discuss details of those actions towards the end of the webinar, and here we are. There are two paths you can take. If you were not prepared, or if you were prepared. If you were prepared, your life is a lot easier because you planned for this. You know your family members have water, and supplies in their cars, and they know what to do. You might even have a checklist next to your bed ready to use. If there were an earthquake country, you, were, you, would know some, you would know that some of the windows in your home may have broken and to wear sturdy shoes when walking around at night after a quake. You can remind your family to be ready for many aftershocks in an earthquake country. It's just nature relieving pressure and earthquakes are expected in earthquake country. Once you have checked the family inside the house and you know you have sufficient water for two weeks, you can check outside for damage and decide if you want to check on your neighbors. Yesterday was quite newsworthy day. You remember you had the disaster. Throughout the US, there were mock earthquakes. Lucky for us, our companies had re recently 
sent out letters to employees with the following message. All right, I am now your company president. Woohoo! Dear fellow employees. <laughs> Dear fellow employees, as you know, our business believes in preparedness, and I believe in preparedness. You have all seen photos on our Facebook account showing my water supplies in my car in my house. You never know when you will need those water supplies. Congratulations to all of you who, who have prepared in the same way. Maybe our city experiences a flood and drinking water is limited. With you and your 14 days of water, you will be able to live without assistance from emergency services. After all, they will be quite busy. Or maybe you will be on a driving vacation to California and they have a cat catastrophic earthquake. You will be ready as you can be with your water and food supplies in your car. And speaking of earthquakes, because of the recent quake activity in various parts of the U.S., I thought I would share an earthquake response checklist that I got from a friend in California. It has useful information that applies to most disasters. Thanks again for being part of our preparedness campaign. Signed, the President. Thank you very much, President Deb. Yes, it was perfect timing for the President to send this out a few weeks ago. And doesn't it show the President's enthusiasm for a preparedness campaign? But it didn't cost him a lot of money to do that, him or her, to do a lot of money didn't cost them a lot of money to do so. On day two after the quake, you got your family together. They were fine. You decided to go to work and help activate the company's business continuity plan. Your assignment, sufficient supplies of water at home and in cars this week or even today or tomorrow if you can. Prepare a family preparedness plan. They are online at ready.gov. Help your company prepare. We now have time for discussions and questions. We covered a lot of information here, but we're uh, hopeful that you enjoyed it. Yes, Ed, that was very informative. I think you did a very thorough job in all of your uh, presentation today. We haven't had any questions along the way, so, I'd like to encourage that if anyone has a question, right now would be the time to uh, ask that question. Otherwise, we will be ending the webinar a few, minute er few minutes early, which um, is never a complaint. <laughs> I, 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 do have, I do have a couple prepared questions, uh, and I'll okay. just run, I'll run over them. People can leave if they, if they have to dash off, but I must well cover a couple of these things that I thought were important. Um, there's always a lot of concern about carrying plastic bottles in your car and that they were unsafe. Well, as of August 27, 2019, most of the experts are saying that water bottles are safe in cars as long as you keep them within their, their expiration date. The new bottles have different types of, they're made of different, different products, so they do not out, out, the, the plastic doesn't leach from them the way it used to in the olden days. That's just the information that I've collected. Another question, what about the triangle of life for earthquakes? Some people have heard that you don't want to get under something sturdy, you want to get next to something sturdy. Well, that all that information is flawed. Uh, the Red Cross, I've got a bullet from them. Um, there's information on this, and we will include these questions with, uh, with the presentation. Uh, we recommend sticking with safety information prepared by established earthquake safety experts, such as the American Red Cross, FEMA, and Earthquake Country Alliance. Drop, cover, and hold on. And if you are, are in a wheelchair, you just uh, draw, you, you duck and put your hands over your head and, and hang on because you won't be able to roll anywhere safely or if you're ambulatory, you won't be able to walk anywhere safely because of an earthquake's uh, severe shaking. Another question is, what well, should we store in? Oops, go ahead, Deborah. I was going to say, we do have a couple of questions that we, um, we have from the audience. Do you want to do, finish your question, then I'll ask the audience questions? 
Um, sure, I'll finish this easy question. But what, what should we store in our car for food? Because you know you can't put one of these uh, uh, fruit bars that you get from the grocery store in the car for more than it's got a, like a three. Uh, it's got a, a thirty day shelf life or something like that. So you need to make sure it has a long shelf life. So one thing you can do is uh, carry emergency food rations that you can buy at uh, many different um, stores that have a five-year shelf life. They're nine bars and uh, in, in them and they have enough calories. They really don't taste very good, but it's food and sometimes we'll eat anything we can get. In addition, you can carry peanut butter powder with your water. You can spoon it up. It's got a longer shelf life. Uh, so there's some, another reason for you to have water. So go ahead, Deborah. Sure. So is there a resource to assist nonprofits in getting supplies for emergency preparedness? Uh, good question. Uh, getting supplies. Uh, are we talking about getting free supplies, do you think? It looks like that, and I would imagine that there might be some grants available through FEMA or otherwise, but I don't know the answer to that question myself. Uh, I can, I'll can look into that. I'm not aware of that, and I work for a few nonprofits. Um, I think the grant approach is the right way to go. It depends what your, what your needs are for your nonprofit, because uh, some nonprofits have a lot of people that they're taking care of, and that would be more reason to have uh, to work a grant to get funds for emergency food supplies. And while I'm on that subject, uh, there are suppliers that provide water that has longer than a two-year shelf life, which is how long most bottled water is a shelf life. Of. And that's because uh, the water, the, the plastic can degrade and just fail and start leaking after a few years that they have water mm -hmm. that has a 10 year shelf life now that you can buy in liter quantities. And uh, that's what I have in my car um, so that uh, if I forget after a couple of years, I still have it, it's water is good for 10 years. Right, off, so it's not, the, it's, not the water that it, it's not the water that expires, it's the packaging that <laughs> breaks yeah. down. Yeah, um, should, we be, should we be aware of electrical outlets under our desks in the event of an earthquake? Um, it's well. I, as soon as you mentioned that, I remember many people at where I used to work who had no room under their desk for anything, even even power cords. Um, that is not too big of an issue. Most important thing is periodically look under your desk to make sure you don't have any sharp object objects down there that can cause harm if you lights go off and you have to jump under your desk. So many people in Japan, uh, from the videos I've seen, when they have an earthquake, they run out the door and they have been instructed since they were wee ones to get under something sturdy and hold on. But it's human nature not to do that. So I highly recommend if you feel an earthquake coming, and if, even if you think it's going to be a little one, just practice getting under there. When shakeout San Diego, mm -hmm. when shakeout California occurs, or shakeout America now uh, occurs in October, take that time to practice getting under something sturdy and hanging on. Uh, as far as electrical connections, as long as the wires are protected and not showing, then you shouldn't have any problems down there. Okay. Um, for a large office building with anywhere from 20 to 30 people on a floor at any given time, how much first aid do you need to have on hand? Would a, would a 50 person kit be sufficient? Uh, that's a good question. It really it depends if it's just an office environment or if there's some manufacturing going on, uh, the, the tools that are used in that particular uh, environment. Uh, I would recommend that you work with your uh, insurance person that does periodic visits and just get get confirmation on him or her what you should need. Okay, and our last um, our last one is a comment. Um, there's one person on the line regarding the the question that we had earlier about how a nonprofit can get um, supplies. 
There's one person on the webinar that said that their county has an emergency preparedness committee and the county purchase supplies for their business. So that's a pretty cool county that you live in, wherever that might be. <laughs> and one last question, what is a good strategy to get leadership involved, to have them start the process to understand what the critical operations are? Well, that's, that is probably the most complicated question that anybody could ask. Uh, because you have different types of leaders. The leaders that, uh, that are open, that are friendly, that you can just talk to while you're going down the, the hallway, those leaders can, will probably be transformable uh, better than the ones that are so focused on their business that they aren't really paying attention. And I'm sorry that, that we have a lot of different types of people. Um, so my approach is to uh, try to provide to the leader little bits of information to get them thinking about it. Just one tidbit, maybe a month. And what you can do is share what other people are doing with your, with the, with the boss. Say, oh, you know what, I saw Deb and she's got, she's got water in the back of her car and I'm just so uh, proud of her. This is preparedness month. Uh, boss, can you, can you, but next time you see her, can you thank her for carrying water in her car? So in just doing different little hints, you cannot convince someone there's gonna be a disaster. You cannot convince people that we need to prepare. You just kind of have to build that culture. All right, so um, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. We will send information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. And thank you, Ed Langmaid, for your time and expertise today. We hope all of the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of your time. And be sure to join us on September 17th for conducting a facility security assessment without needing a security consultant. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a safe day.